everybody has uh, been missing Sunday school, and I don't uh, want to get us off on the wrong foot, but I know over the years we've often um, been uh, opened with a joke and not a prayer. We'll get to the prayer, but I thought there's two quick little uh, puns uh, that you may have missed in your uh, intervening months here, so I'm going to give you a quick one. The first one is more of a Christmas joke. Uh, does anyone know how much Santa had to pay for his sleigh? He didn't pay anything. It was on the house. Um, the second joke is, um, or it's actually a, a pun or a supposed graffiti that someone saw. It said, I'm afraid of elevators, but I'm taking steps to avoid them. So now we'll try to get serious and get on with our Sunday school lesson. And I'll open with a short prayer. Precious God, we've missed uh, being together as a class, but we have been together in a number of forms. Uh, I want to thank you among all the many blessings you have given us for the blessing of the Faith Builders class. Uh, I don't know of any ask or call or cry for some sort of help or assistance that's gone up from this class that has not been answered by uh, a ready and willing class member or members. Uh, I know that to be true uh, in my recent memory, and uh, I thank you for that. So, as, a, as a, an item that's probably been on all of our minds when we see Mary Lou's emails, I want to thank you again for the Faith Builders class. Amen. This lesson was supposed to have been delivered um, in mid-March, I think actually March the 15th. So I'm only uh, five months or 22 weeks late, but I have an excuse. The dog ate my notes. Actually, I don't have a dog. We have been studying, or we began studying, the disciples' prayer uh, the Lord's Prayer, the Avenue Prayer, the Pater Noster, the Disciples' Prayer. We, we started studying this at, uh, as with many things, uh, at the behest, at the encouragement of Tom Fairley. Um, he taught probably the, um, the first, the introduction to this, and Chris Hagee, followed that with uh, the uh, first lesson. This is the second lesson, uh, or the second part of the actual exegesis of the, of the Avinu prayer. Uh, it is only two phrases. Uh, Chris taught uh, our Father who art in heaven, and may your name be sanctified, or as we say it, hallowed be thy name. I am going to be pre uh, teaching, uh, preaching, that's a joke, uh, is also two phrases. And if you have a Bible, and you probably do, and it may be open to Matthew, um, look at 10a and 10b. Uh, the a part of this is, may your name be blessed. That's, uh, and the B part is, your will shall be done in heaven and on earth. The, a good thing to do might be to go back and say, okay, what's going on here? How did we get to the Lord's Prayer? Uh, just as a quick recap, the Sermon on the Mount starts in chapter 5. And Jesus te is teaching. And he continues teaching his disciples into six. Now six starts um, and leads directly to, I believe, uh, six nine, which is where the prayer starts. But in verse one of, of uh, six, he challenges us uh, on true piety. This means righteousness 
done inconspicuously versus false piety, um, hypocrisy, uh, acting out ostentatiously. In verses 2 through 4, he cautions about almsgiving, not only to give money, but other charitable actions. And in 5 through 8, he has three admonitions regarding prayer. First is, don't be like the hypocrites standing out on the steps of the temple praying. Don't go um, to uh, very flourishing words. And lastly, um, don't, um, oh no, second one is, is to go to your room and close the door. And then the third one is, don't uh, pile up fancy words or don't go to flourishing and ostentatious language. So, uh, that's leading up to where Chris's two phrases started, and I mine will follow. If you want a concise version of the Lord's Prayer, you can go to Luke 11, 1 through 4. Not following the Sermon on the Mount, but part of the Sermon on the Plain. It's only four verses, quite short. Um, but you can probably see why... Uh, Christianity has adopted or has adapted, adopted and adapted the, the longer version. Uh, now to Matthew 6, 10. But first, um, the book, a, a Prayer to Our Fathers, excuse me, yeah, A Prayer to Our Fathers, is written by Nehemiah Gordon, and Keith Johnson. Nehemiah Gordon uh, is a, well, I'll, I'll let Nehemiah Gordon tell you a little story about if I could get my Kindle to open up here, I would encourage you that if you're going to use your Kindle or your iPad or to, to use it to buy an iBook and to study it, it's not a good idea very hard to use a highlighter on your Kindle. Uh, anyway, um, I, I, I did this and I, I probably won't do it again. This is um, the, uh, Nehemiah Gordon talking about uh, the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. If someone had told me as a young man that I would one day be joining a Christian, Keith Johnson is a, an American black minister who sought out somebody who could guide him through a trip into Israel to study how the Lord's Prayer probably, to give it context, how it came together and how, why Jesus would have said these words. He was led in a long, circuitous route uh, to Nehemiah Gordon. And Nehemiah Gordon is saying, that one day I would be joining a Christian to study the Hebrew origins of a prayer taught by Jesus and recorded in the New Testament. I would have not believed them. I was raised in Chicago as the son of an Orthodox, Orthodox Jewish rabbi with a classical Jewish education. From an early age, I studied the Hebrew Bible and the Talmud. Among my earliest memories is sitting at my father's knee being taught that God revealed the traditions recorded in the Talmud to Moses on Mount Sinai. When I was old enough to study the Talmud for myself, I saw that it actually contained the opinions of the ancient rabbis who debated one another on every conceivable subject. Statements so common in the Hebrew Bible such as, Thus says the Lord, and the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, were nowhere to be found. To make matters worse, many of the interpretations in the Talmud seemed implausible to me. Well, he goes on to tell that in his elementary school, he spoke up one day and said exactly that. This stuff in the Talmud seems very um, implausible to me and it's not, uh, it's not found in the Hebrew Bible. And 
his, his teacher, the rabbi, um, rebuked him strongly and said, you are a Kara, Karaite. Uh, that translates into language that we would understand as a scripturalist, a somebody who would only believe the written word. Uh, Nehemiah Gordon has the problem that many of us have had over time in realizing how many people have touched the, the words over time. How many scribes, how many people have uh, interpreted, reinterpreted, harmonized, and do all the, done all the things that are done to the text that we have become so comfortable with. So I say all that to say that he and Keith Johnson used something called Hebrew Matthew. Now, what is Hebrew Matthew? Well, Hebrew Matthew is um, something that was written by a Spanish Jewish rabbi in uh, Shem Tob's Hebrew Matthew was written in, I believe, the 14th century. And um, what it was part of a of a treatise that he wrote called the Touchstone. Now you're saying to yourself, why would a Jewish rabbi write a Hebrew version of Matthew? Since you know that they don't really believe uh, the story that Matthew is telling. Well, he, it is an anti-Christian treatise, um, and he is trying to. Um, argue two things that the one number one that Jesus is God and number two that the Messiah the role of the Messiah is incorrectly attributed to Jesus so he's writing it from a negative standpoint but uh, it is full of information and is not in its straight language that much different than the the Gospel of Matthew that we read. Um, let me see if I've left anything out. The Hebrew name uh, in English for Gospel of Matthew is Matthew. Ye I had I, I had this uh, learned earlier, so I wouldn't stumble. But Matthew Tayahu means a gift of Yahweh. Uh, we use the Greek Matean gospel, uh, meaning Matthew, and we, we use a lot of the words uh, that, that stream from this, from this root. Um, let me see. What else I need here? Okay. Now, I also wrote up here, because we are talking about a translation, we're talking about things that stem from, um, our gospel may stem from um, people's thoughts about this Hebrew Matthew, it may not, uh, but it comes obviously from, from Matthew, which we've always accepted was written in the Greek, and there's not a whole lot of reason to disbelieve that now, although there, although there are people who say um, that that may not be totally true. That's a dis discussion for another day. But also in talking about um, translations, uh, when I was thinking of the Shem Tobes uh, writing of the of the Hebrew Matthew, I thought about the Masoretic text. And we've talked about this just really briefly uh, before uh, in, as it has come up uh, at appropriate times when we've talked about translations. Um, and this is something that happened uh, from, from the 7th 
to the 10th century AD. Uh, it's known as the Masora. A group of men were challenged um, to write a Hebrew Bible, an Old Testament, the Tanakh. And to do so, they had to translate the Greek. Now, you're saying to yourself, why? That makes no sense. Well, what happened is when the Israelites left in 587, 586, and went to Babylon, they still had Hebrew scrolls, they still spoke Hebrew. Uh, and the longer they stayed in Babylon for 40 years and a, and a generation or two died out and almost no one made it back uh, to uh, Palestine, to Israel when they were uh, returned, um, they began to speak Aramaic and Aramaic became the language that they spoke in. So over time there, there, were, there was no uh, Hebrew Bible. So these men started to gather and rewrite from any information they could the, the definitive Hebrew Old Testament, as we would call it. Um, 24 books because they don't separate chronicles and kings, etc. Um, and they wanted to put all the little diacritical markings and since uh, vowels are imputed or understood, they wanted to get it right. They used uh, a lot of things. One of the things they used was the uh, Syriac translation, the Peshitta, which is, um, was available to them. Anyway, uh, it's just an interesting side note uh, to me uh, to realize that this bumper sticker theology that many people have is really not helpful, certainly not helpful to me, I, I, maybe it's helpful to them, but it's not helpful to me and I think most of the people in this class would agree that our, our studies are um, delving back into how each word uh, began and how it may have changed and how it how we have changed it, how we've changed the King James based on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, anyway, it's, it's more revealing and it helps build my faith, not, not struggle with my faith. Anyway, thinking back to the beginning of this whole study, I thought to myself, who among us, uh, and certainly not me, and maybe a couple in this class could have, but who, who could have said uh, the Lord's Prayer is in Matthew 6? I think it starts at verse 8, 9, 10, somewhere in there. I'm not one of those people who could have done that. Um, I, would have, I would have struggled to, to place it, and I, uh, I don't know how close I would have come. Now, let's go to um, Matthew 6, 10a. Uh, 10a is may your kingdom be blessed uh, or may your kingdom be sanctified. Um, if you can see this, this is Hebrew Matthew um, and this is the first part of the 10th verse. The NSRV or and King James Version says your kingdom come uh, and the Greek actually translates May your kingdom arrive. The blessed here, the English word bless, comes from the Hebrew word barek. Actually, I think I spelled that wrong. That's supposed to be an H. Uh, barek, which means, which is knee, your physical knee, which is a word that leads us to kneeling and worship. Now, one of the things that we talked about early was, earlier was ostentatious worshiping, adoration versus adulation. Uh, adulation is um, 
fulsome, worship, uh, ostentatious, the pejorative version could be, could be uh, uh, beyond flattery to, um, to just blather. So that's uh, a brief interpretation of that. The may your kingdom be blessed speaks as in the Hebrew, Hebrew Matthew uh, in a present time voice. May your kingdom be blessed. The King James Version, may your kingdom come, speaks in a, a future tense, maybe even an, um, an end times eschatological uh, framework. Um, so there's a difference there that, that is uh, not generally thought about. Let's see. Okay. So that's uh, dealing with 10A. Now, 10B, I didn't really write up there. Or did I? No, I didn't. I didn't write 10B up there. The Hebrew Matthew reads, your will shall be done in heaven and on earth. <clears throat> Nehemiah and Keith uh, went to the Dead Sea, also known as the Salt Sea in Hebrew, about an hour's drive from Jerusalem. This is the lowest point on earth. And, it's cons uh, and they considered these words in, in that location. The words are a call to action to behave, to obey, as the angels do in heaven. The Dead Sea uh, was home nearby to Sodom, Gomorrah, Edna, and to Zeboam, famous for their many iniquities. King David prayed, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. And what? Uh, Jesus or Yeshua would have prayed meant that he meant when he taught not everyone who says my name Lord Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of the Father in heaven again more than just words but a call to action I have a note to read Matthew 7 21 so let me do that unfortunately it slipped my mind what I what I'm doing this for but anyway Matthew 7 21 oh this this is just a that was just a reference note not everyone who says to me Lord Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Again, they're referring to thy will be done in heaven as it is on earth. So, I'm going to go drop back to point um, out on 10a. Many believe thy kingdom come is the central petition of the prayer. Thy kingdom come. Why would that be? Because the connection between the kingdom and the will of God and life are insoluble. Indissoluble, excuse me. That's William Barclay's words. Um, the kingdom of heaven... Uh, uh, Jesus said to Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. He already... Uh, had said in parable form, compared the kingdom to uh, a seed, yeast, a hidden treasure, a pearl of great price. So he had indicated that it was not an earthly kingdom, that it was a kingdom that was either, depending on whether you were looking at present times uh, or end times, to come, will come, uh, arrive, uh, he, he, had, he had made it clear that it was not going to be an earthly kingdom, so he, he was trying to explain to Pilate that he was not trying to be king of anybody. 
here on earth. Um, why would uh, Matthew talk about the kingdom of heaven? Uh, we've talked about this times many times before, but it's simple that Matthew, a Jew, would have been uncomfortable to say the name of God. So he wouldn't have said the kingdom of God, but he would have been comfortable saying the kingdom of heaven. Um, and a pious Jew in those days would not say the name of God. It was too, it was too powerful. It was too awe-inspiring. It was just not good form to do that. So they substituted Adonai, which is uh, Lord. Uh, they substituted that word when they felt compelled to, to sort of anthropomorphize what they were talking about. When, but here they're talking about a kingdom, so they call it the kingdom of, or Matthew calls it the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom, the, that phrase is found 49 times in Matthew, 16 in Mark, and 38 in Luke. Let me see if I've left it. Okay. Another thing to note is that Hebrew is written in parallelisms, uh, saying the same thing in a different way at least twice, sometimes more, but usually twice, um, consecutively. It's probably uh, the standard of oral teaching, uh, which is the way things were taught. There weren't blackboards, you didn't have time to chisel in stone, uh, no laptops, no overheads, no mimeograph pages, no nothing. So you, it was all an oral tradition, rote learning. So you, the teacher said it, the students repeated it, and that's the way they learned it. Um, an example of that goes even back to the Psalms, but this is a very good example of it. Without it being, <clears throat> without the two phrases being so similar uh, that they are the same thing, but it is apparent, what I'm going to read from Psalms 46, 7, that the meaning is the same. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God, Jacob, the God of Jacob is our refuge. So this is two ways uh, consecutively of saying the same thing in different words. So, if thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, are placed in tandem, they probably meant that if one is accomplished, the other is as well. Now back to 10b. Yes, 10b. Thy will be done. This is probably the ruling principle of Christ's life. But especially of the book of John, I'm going to read a couple of things from John. John 4, I should have written these on the board so you would uh, have a reference to them, and I will, I will in just a second. John 4, 31 through 34. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. And also, uh, chapter 5, 30, verse 30. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek to do not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Going back to what I had said in the previous sentence, this is possibly the ruling principle of Christ's life. 
The highest and best in Judaism is the law, the Torah. Not because one had to, not a wearisome or burdensome task, but rather an attitude of a lover whose greatest joy was to obey the wishes of his loved one. Why would a, a first or second century Jew identify with this line? Because he believed in, first, the wisdom of God, second, in the love of God, and third, he had an expectation of God to be just with him. An example can be found in Daniel, specifically 3, 16 through 18. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that as well because that is um, one of my favorite... Um, lost my Daniel marking. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. This may be it. Yep. Uh, one of my favorite uh, sermons of all times uh, was given by Gene Randolph, who was our uh, first minister at Ray Thomas um, up at the end of Sandy Plains. Uh, and he titled it, Nevertheless. So it comes from uh, and is built around um, this part from, from Daniel. Now I've got to find it. Three. Excuse me. Daniel 3. Daniel 3, 16 through 18. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego answered the king. O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, who we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of the blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, here's the nevertheless, which was the title of the sermon. But if not, nevertheless, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. So uh, this is sort of the attitude that this Jew might have had to identify with the Christian prayer of thy will be done in heaven as it is on earth. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego were facing the fiery furnace, but they said, we're going to do God's will, not worship a, a, a golden statue. So that is really the end of my two phrases of the Lord's Prayer, uh, the Our Father, the Venu Prayer, etc. I do have, however, a couple of what we in this class have become to know as gratuities um, that came from Tom's uh, phraseology or his naming of things that just sort of go with the lesson but are not really critical to the lesson. They may be, uh, give you some area to expand the lesson a bit. Uh, when Tom taught the introduction to this, he spoke, he said that Jesus spoke, or Yeshua spoke four languages, Aramaic, Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. Now, I, I wondered about that, and I just wondered about it. And so I looked um, to my available sources, and limited they may be, uh, I could only find three. I, I couldn't find any reference to uh, Yeshua ever speaking Latin. I was willing to give the part, the belief that he might have been able to read some Latin, but probably didn't speak it. I challenged Tom on that, but I didn't talk him out of it. As a matter of fact, it got worse. Um, he said uh, that he thought it was likely that he spoke several other languages, Arabic, 
Farsi. I think I did talk him out of Farsi, uh, but also uh, Sumerian and Akkadian. Um, so there is um, just some more information. But if there were, we know that in the lexicon of many people who were alive during this uh, 1 BC, 1 AD, or 0 AD, 1st century, 2nd century, Christ times, there were three uh, very common languages in use at that time. Aramaic probably was the language of the street. Hebrew, which many people spoke from memory, but Aramaic is has roots in, in Hebrew. And Greek, which was the currency, uh, uh, was a was a very official language. No, it wasn't the official. Latin was the official Roman language, but Greek was the language of trade, so many people spoke that as well. Uh, monetary things were done in Greek. So we know that. We also know that below the Christ, the cross of Christ, um, the initialism I-N-R-I is in Latin. And this, uh, just for fun, we'll, we'll write this down. Uh, let's see if we can go away with all of this. Tom gets away with erasing during his lesson, so I'll, I'll feel comfortable doing it. I-N-R-I. Uh, that's called the initialism. And that's in Latin. The I is for... I E. Why can't I? Why am I having trouble with this? I E S U S. We're going to get to the this in just a second. Um, the R is for um, Rex. Meaning king. Um, the N, uh, uh, the N is for, oh, excuse me, I left at the N. All right, excuse me. Nazarene. I'm not going to bother with the, with the Latin version, but it stood for Nazarene. And the um, I is for, hmm. Why do I not have that written down? Oh well, doesn't matter. But you can see, you can see that that was in the Latin. It's also written in uh, Greek, King of the Judeans, and it was written in Hebrew as well. All right, now we're going to talk briefly, and we have to, very briefly. Tom has talked about this, and he talked about it in the context of. We read, and a child will be born to him, he will be wrapped in swaddling clothes, and he will be called Jesus. And of course, he could not have been called Jesus. And why could he have not been called Jesus? Because the J had never been invented. He would have used, it would have been the I. Okay, why, how did we get from the I to the J? Very quickly, let me just erase this, and I hope you can see this name here. John Giorgio Trissino was, a, was an Italian Renaissance grammarian who invented the J. Before that, the I was kind of a swoosh, just like that. No disrespect to Nike. Uh, but what he ended up doing was putting a dot over it and changing the sound from a y to a j. And that's where the j came from. Before that time, there were, there were no j's. Uh, this lesson that I took from the um, internet says that j was a bit of a late bloomer, and that's true. It was the last letter added to the alphabet. Um, there is a lot there, but are the J and the I related? A J's phonetic quest for independence probably began, began with the letter I. 
originally a Phoenician pictogram represented with a leg and a hand and denoting a sound similar to the Y in yes. I was later adopted by Semitic groups to describe the word arm, which in Semitic language began with a J, also possessing the same Y sounds in yes. So anyway, this um, grammarian decided enough of the confusion uh, about the sounds uh, and he made a clear distinction between the two. His contribution is important because once he distinguished the soft J sound, as in jam, probably a lone sound, he was able to identify the Greek Eusus, a translation of Yeshua, uh, to Jesus. And that became the uh, lingua franca, as it were, for the rest of time. So that is the end of my lesson and the gratuities. And now I'm going to close us with a prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Help us not to pray as rote learners, but to use this exercise that we are going through to gain better understanding and a stronger commitment to the words that we're saying. Amen. This has been a ministry of First Presbyterian Church of Marietta, Georgia. Join us as together we change lives with faith, hope, and love. For more information, go to fpcmarietta.org. Thank you and have a blessed day.